Hey, it's Jeff. Uh, been a little bit of a break due to various reasons, but let's get back into it. We're doing the Cordial Catholic again. Would the early church fathers fit in at your evangelical church? Hi, I'm Kay Albert Little, an evangelical convert to Catholicism. And one of the things that drew me into the Catholic Church, and this is the same for lots of converts, was the early church, the early church fathers, the very first Christian writers that we have recorded after the apostles, after the writers of the New Testament, and some contemporary with the writers and the writings of the New Testament in some cases. And one of my friends, Rod Bennett, who is also a convert from evangelical Christianity and through the early church fathers has written a number of books on these subjects. He was a guest on my podcast recently. I'll put a link down in the description of this video to that episode. But one of the questions that he asked that I think was so challenging to evangelicals who are looking into Christian history and looking into the Catholic church, maybe in the, the history of Christianity, the, the early church is would any of the early church fathers be welcomed as a teaching pastor in your evangelical church? Well, how, how about all the early church fathers who knew absolutely nothing about the Assumption of Mary? How about all the early church fathers that knew nothing of purgatory? Or the early church fathers who didn't believe in a papacy? Would they be welcome to teach and be a pastor at a Roman Catholic church? It's such a fascinating and rich question. Because well, it's only fascinating and rich if you've never really thought that, hey, the Roman Catholic church of today doesn't match the church of the first century either. That everybody has kind of progressed since then. So uh, let's not use unequal weights and measures. Let's continue. Because to answer that question involves wrestling with what the early church fathers believe and what... Did you wrestle with it? Did you even know that the Assumption of Mary was completely unknown of for centuries and centuries? You believe in your evangelical church. Now, here's what Rod says. He says, sure, you can find lots of these early church fathers who say things that sound evangelical. Well, yeah, you have stuff... That's very evangelical. They were evangelists after all. But you also find those same early church fathers saying things that are distinctly Catholic. They like when they said things like Mary was a sinner. Let me see if I have that. Uh, or no, lack of, that's the lack of relics uh, playlist. Uh, oh yeah. Here's the playlist on how all these different early church fathers who didn't believe that Mary was sinless. Things about baptism, that it really saves. Things about the Eucharist, that it really was the flesh and blood of Jesus. It's hard to get into that because you had different people who d believed different things and you had people who were using language, which you can, after the fact, you can, like, say... I'm very sure Augustine did not believe in the real presence. But you can read him, and he's talking about the flesh and blood, but then in another section, he's you know saying it's bread, right? And it's pretty clear he was being, uh, using, for lack of a better term, flowery uh, language. So you... It's in a four or five minute video, it's easy to kind of just say, or it's easy to pull out quotes and then just say, oh, look, there he's, he's uh, saying flesh and blood without actually looking over the volumes and volumes and volumes and even the stuff we don't have that's extant where it clarifies that he did not use a have a real presence view things like confession relics the same oh confession and relics confession uh auricular confession originated i believe in ireland in the eighth century and from our playlist on 
relics. Here, let's and, go with this. And this is the point where they say, hey, a lot of other stuff, it's hard to, for us to trace back that far, but but this one we can trace all the way back to the scriptures. And, and there's two interesting points I want to make. All right, I'll let you guys, uh, I'll put a link into this and we'll uh, let you go, because I think I played this last time, because I think you mentioned uh, relics last time. You, they can't uh, trace it back before the late 4th century. And it makes me wonder, like, what what is going on here? Why why does does he view a quote from the late fourth century and be like, whoa, that's the early church, or or does is there some sort of psychological thing going on? I'd have to like talk to him, say what did you see, when did you see it, that sort of thing. Things these things are distinctly Catholic. And those early church fathers who say things that sound evangelical that might fit in your evangelical church would have fit in mine also say things that are at odds with the evangelical faith. And they say things that are at odds with Roman Catholicism. Let's not be naive. Let's, or maybe better yet, let's not be ignorant. Things that would not fit. Things that if they said in that church... It'd be thrown out of town. It's a great question. And they, they would be condemned as a heretic today in Roman Catholicism. But the way you get around that is to say, well, it wasn't defined yet or something like that. It's, it's a dodge. My answer, well, my evangelical church is very tolerant of different ideas. Our belief system is, is more wide open. We believe in Christ centered on Christ, and these other things are, are add-ons, and they're negotiable. But in that case, would an early church father who held a different view on, on that, the ability to negotiate discipline and, and doctrine and beliefs, be welcome in your church? Because you have early church fathers like Irenaeus, who wrote massive works against heretics, against people who didn't fit in what was a singular, united church passed on from the apostles through the succession of, of bishops through councils so would he fit uh you want to go with the succession of bishops all right this is from pope benedict the concept of apostolic succession was clearly formulated as von kampuhausen has impressively demonstrated in the anti-gnostic polemics of the second century Okay, apostolic succession does not come from the first century, and not, as some Roman Catholic writers assert, in the first century. Its purpose was to contrast true apostolic tradition of the church with the pseudo-apostolic tradition of Gnosis. So, in seed form, the, what we today believe as apostolic succession is in Roman Catholic uh, terms, uh, comes from Irenaeus and anti-Gnostic, uh, out of an anti-Gnostic apologetic, which made sense at the time, but it's not in the same way. I'm sorry, he looks kind of goofy there. Let me... No, no more help. Um, so, then anti-Gnostic uh, apostolic succession and how Irenaeus used it made sense, but it's it wasn't in relation to a non-existent papacy, which is how they define it today. So, um, anyway, let's keep going. In your evangelical church? Because he would get there and say, hey, these things don't fit with what I believe back here and wrote about, and he didn't preach tolerance. The other church didn't, didn't preach that. So, I don't think that works. And maybe you'd say, well... <laughs> you, do you want to talk about Pope Francis and preaching tolerance? You want to go over the video where um, all the other stuff? This early church father wrote about these things that are very evangelical, and, and so they would fit in. But again, dig deeper. Because it's one thing to pick and choose quotes from the early church fathers that seem to sound evangelical. But I can guarantee you 
Look deeper. Look at what else that early church father said, because they'll say things that are distinctly Catholic. And how do you wrestle with those? By actually understanding. I'm sorry, dude. Um, I keep making your face look funny. There you go. Um, and you can do that to me, so I don't care. Uh, again, he 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 has such a truncated idea of what actually happened in history. Some some sort of idealized view. He he doesn't even understand what runs counter to him. It's kind of. I think it's ignorance. I I, I don't. The vibe I'm getting from him is that he means well, and I don't think he, um, I don't think he understands what's going on. I don't think he has a full knowledge of history. So, it's a great challenge, I think, and really one worth digging into, worth thinking about, worth turning over in your head. Because what is the ramification? If the early church fathers, that these writers who were taught by the disciples, who in many cases were writing contemporary to the writings of the New Testament shortly thereafter, who come from the same lineage, the same early Christian church that, that, that wrote the Bible, right? If those guys... His appeal, I guess, is more persuasive if you don't understand his basic factual errors and all the things he's intentionally or unintentionally hiding from you. It wouldn't be welcome in your church. Well, then, what does that say about your church? Or the church that Christ founded? Pope Francis, dude. It's a great question. So, what do you think? I think you need to learn more. Okay, that's it. I'll talk to you guys later. Hope all is well. God bless.